Next on KCTS 9, a debate between the candidates for Washington's first congressional district. Incumbent Democrat Susan Del Bene squares off against Republican challenger Pedro Celis. See where the candidates stand on immigration, minimum wage, gridlock, Ebola, and other issues. Election 2014, the first congressional district debate is coming up next. Hello, I'm Enrique Cerna. And I'm Deborah Wong. Welcome to Election 2014, the first congressional district debate. We are coming to you from the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington, in front of a live audience. KCTS 9 has partnered with Seattle City Club, Microsoft, and Boeing to bring you this debate with the candidates for Washington's first congressional district, Susan Del Bene and Pedro Celis. The debate is also being simulcast on KUOW 94.9 News and Information. And here quickly are the ground rules. Each candidate will get a two-minute opening statement, followed by questions from the moderators. Candidates will have up to 90 seconds to respond to most questions, though some may be shorter. There will be no rebuttals, but each candidate does get three challenge cards, they look like this, to use during the forum to rebut something the op their opponent stated. They'll have 30 seconds to make their challenge, and the challenged candidate will have 30 seconds to respond. Then, each candidate will get a 90-second closing statement. All questions were developed by KCTS 9 producers and Seattle City Club. The order of the questioning was determined in advance in a random but fair manner. Now, here are the candidates. We ask the audience to hold their applause until we have introduced both. First, incumbent Representative Susan Del Bene, who prefers the Democratic Party, and challenger Pedro Celis, who prefers the Republican Party. Please give them a round of applause. Let's start out with opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes. The order of opening statements was determined before the show by a coin toss, and we begin with Susan Del Bene. Thank you. I'm Susan Del Bene, and I represent the 1st Congressional District. And I know, like many of you, how Washington, D.C. is broken. And when I started running for Congress, I wanted to make sure that we had folks who were willing to get past the partisanship, work together, and focus on getting results. And we know that there have been great opportunities to get results, and we've had great work happen right here in Washington State to show the incredible things that can happen when people work together. We had the bridge collapse up between Burlington and Mount Vernon, the Skagit Bridge on I-5. When that collapsed, people came together, did everything possible to make sure that we responded quickly and got that bridge up again as soon as possible. And when we had the devastating and heartbreaking mudslide between Oso and Darrington, people came together across the community, across the state, across the country to do everything possible to help the families, to help the community, and that's because people who don't always agree on everything work together to make sure we got things done. We need more of that in Washington, D.C. I've been doing my part to help push forward bipartisan legislation. I'm on the Ag Committee. We passed a farm bill, one of the first far best farm bill we've ever had for Washington State farmers. That took a bipartisan effort, and I also got to work with the Senate to make sure we got legislation that could be signed by the President. We when student loan rates doubled last year, we were able to roll that back again with a bipartisan effort, and I was able to help secure $200 million to make sure that people on nutrition programs had access to job training and education so that they could get back in the workforce and be in a place where they could be self-sufficient. There's so much more we need to do, like comprehensive immigration reform, ongoing work on college affordability. I'm going to continue to work in a bipartisan mass matter if I'm reelected, and I want to ask for your support. Thank you. Pedro Celis, your opening statement. Hello, I'm Pedro Celis. It's a privilege to be here. This is a room which I have given presentations in the past, so it's very nice to be here. Thank you for all of you people from Microsoft and for the organizers of this event. My name is Pedro Celis, and I'm running for the first congressional district. I'm the candidate with the charming accent. <laughs> the reason why I have that accent is because I was born and raised in Mexico. My wife and I uh, went to college there. We left Mexico to pursue the American dream. We studied a master's and a doctorate degree in computer science. I was a professor for a number of years. I worked in the Bay Area and in Texas, and came here to Microsoft 16 years ago. 
At Microsoft, I was the chief technical officer of the SQL Server Group and became a Microsoft Distinguished Engineer when they created uh, those positions. And I'm proud to have been living here all the 16 years. And the reason why I'm running for Congress relates to the story of my life. I have been adopted in this country. We've been blessed here. And it is not just a duty, but a real privilege to serve this country. There are things that are going in the wrong direction that I think we need to change. I believe in the American dream, and I want to preserve the American dream. I believe in this country, and I believe this country is worth fighting for. There are issues that are important that affect the future of our kids and future generations. Issues like balancing the budget. This government spending is out of control. Immigration reform is essential. Immigration is not just the story of this country. It's essential for our economic growth. And over-regulation, as I go up and down this district, that is a topic that shows up every time. Different agencies, different issues, but the over-regulation. And they feel they're not being well represented, in particular the Farm Bureau. They, that's why they have endorsed me instead of Susan Del Bene, even though she claims she got the best Farm Bill for the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the questioning now. Let's start with the topic of gridlock, something I'm sure you've heard of before. Um, polls show that Americans are frustrated with Congress. Latest Gallup poll says approval rating is at about 14%. Uh, that's actually better than it was when partisan fighting brought about the two-week shutdown of the uh, federal government. So the question is, who is to blame? 90 seconds to answer, and we'll start first with uh, Pedro Celas. Uh, so who's to blame? Well, pretty much everybody there. Uh, it's not like I can say it's all the fault of the Democrats or it's all the fault of the Democrats. But if I have to pick one person to blame, it will be the president. You know, this president is not engaging with the Senate in getting things resolved. We have seen many presidents in the past, Republican presidents, Democrat presidents, whose House and Senate were controlled by a different party. And they managed to get things done. They went there and negotiated. They talked about what is the things that we can agree on. And then they gave that message to the public. And the public gave that message also to the members of Congress. So if I have to pick the person I would blame the most, I guess, would be uh, the president. But there's plenty of blame uh, to go around. That's one of the reasons that encouraged me to run for this. My life story has been as a consensus builder, a problem solver. Yes, I'm a very smart technical person, but what made me successful was not that, but that ability to work with people who have a very diverse set of point of views, a very different idea on how to solve a problem and find that common ground and move things forward. All right, Susan DeBene. Um, you know, we represent, I, our district is a incredibly diverse district, and it was set up to be a diverse district. We have many differing points of view, and as you travel throughout our district, it's been important for me to listen to those different points of view so we can come up with solutions that are so important to solving a problem for everyone. And in Washington, D.C., I think you're a better legislator when you represent a district like mine because you have that opportunity to bring those different points of view forward and develop solutions. We need people who are focused on solutions. And I've been working with my colleagues across the aisle on many issues, whether it's the Farm Bill, on college affordability, um, on job training programs. I also work with Congressman Doc Hastings from Eastern Washington on legislation to make the sales tax deduction permanent for Washington State residents. I work with Congressman Reichert on Alpine Lakes wilderness legislation. It really is about folks reaching out and focusing on getting things done. Um, even in situations where we've had um, issues, for example, with reigning in the NSA and addressing privacy throughout our country, um, that's been a bipartisan effort. I've worked with Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin on the USA Freedom Act to help um, rein in the NSA. It's all about people working together. We need more folks who are willing to do that and push bipartisan legislation forward. Thank you. Question about Ebola. We heard that a second healthcare worker in Texas has tested positive for the disease, and we also know that she actually flew on an airplane possibly after she was exposed. We heard today that Dr. Nancy Snyderman violated her quarantine uh, when she returned from West Africa. Do we trust the healthcare system has this under control, or does the federal government need to do more? 
and you have 90 seconds to answer, and uh, Susan Del Benny, you begin. Um, the, the case of the second worker in Dallas coming down with Ebola highlights how important it is that we have an incredibly strong response and that people come together and make sure we understand all that can be done to address this crisis. Um, first, making sure all of our federal agencies, our public health officials, our medical staff across the country have all the information they need, are sharing information on best tra practices, that we have scientists who are working on research for prevention as well as therapies and cures and diagnostics. Um, it's gonna take a coordinated effort. And it's very, very important that Congress make sure that resources are available to help support these efforts. We voted in September for resources. There's more we can do. This is also an international issue. So we need to work with the international community as well. But it's very, very important, again, that Congress make sure resources are available and that we work with the entire community to have best practices moving forward throughout the United States. Thank you. Pedro Silas. You know, Ebola, one thing you may not feel as strongly as I do is the compassion that comes from this country. This country shows compassion through the years in helping many people around the world on many issues. And Ebola is one in which that compassion will have a significant effect on how Ebola is going to be controlled. But the question was about are we handling it well, you know, the traffic of people here, and I don't believe so. You know, I have managed all kinds of different groups, I have made all kinds of decisions, and many times you need to make decisions quick. You know, and you know that sometimes some decisions you'll make will be wrong. So you have to always assess the decision that you're making on what is the worst case scenario. If I pick this, what's the worst that can happen? If I pick this, what is the worst that can happen? So in controlling Ebola, you want to be on the side of reducing risk. You know, having all the people coming here, you probably should reduce that and not have so many flights coming into the country and have only one airport that knows how to do it. You know, only one or two you know, hospitals that know how to handle it, so you can be sure that you are not making mistakes that are very significant. Uh, so I don't feel uh, that this process is addressing this properly, and I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions on immigration. Everyone seems to agree the immigration system is broken. There is a comprehensive immigration reform bill awaiting action in the House. A similar bill has passed the Senate. Among other things, it would tighten border security, increase the number of visas available to bring workers into this country, and provide a path to citizenship for people who are here illegally. How would you vote on that bill? You've got 90 seconds to answer, and let's start with Susan Del Bene. Yep. Um, well, I helped introduce the bill that we have in the House, H.R. 15. I was one of the five lead sponsors of that legislation. It is a comprehensive immigration reform bill, and every part of it is bipartisan. And this is very important. Our district has technology, agriculture, a border, making sure that we have comprehensive legislation to address the many issues that we see in our immigration system is incredibly important. And when I travel throughout this district, everyone agrees that our immigration system is broken. Um, the bill has over 200 co-sponsors in the House. I believe it would pass if it was allowed a vote on the floor of the House of Representatives. It would help strengthen our border, make sure that um, we got rid of backlogs, it would create jobs, it would reduce the deficit, and it would provide an earned path to citizenship. It's so important that we have a community that works together and also very important that people are clear on what they would do with respect to immigration reform because we have the chance to move this forward if people will work together but also are very specific about the actions that they want to see happen so we can continue to get more people who will um, participate in developing legislation and actually get legislation through. Peter Sellis. Immigration is a topic that as I go around it's one of the first questions they ask, and it's because of this charming accent that is part of the, the reason. But I believe immigration is good for this country. It's not just the story of this country. It's Im immigration is important for our economic future. I believe we want people to come here because it makes this country better economically and in many other ways. And I always describe this as wide doors, high fences. We want the doors to be wide so people can come here legally, and we want to have fences. And if you don't have a fence, what's the point of having a door? And that, I think, is the issue that stops people from making progress here. The concern, I, so you, let me state this again. 
it's very important that we enforce the rule of law. You know, if you are not going to do that, nothing else is going to happen. How do we deal with the people that are already here that are undocumented? About 11 million people, they say, about 60% of them have been here more than six, uh, 10 years. They are part of our economy now, part of our culture, and we need to find a way that we're not going to deport them, that's not fiscally responsible, but you don't want to put them in the path, which is what the Senate bill is doing, of reward that behavior by giving them citizenship. You need to find that common ground and have people that are, have the guts to go and find that common ground and get it resolved. Next. Okay, we have a challenge. Um, Ms. Del Bene, you have 30 seconds to state your challenge, and Mr. Sellis, you'll have 30 seconds to respond. Um, I think this is an incredibly important issue for our region, and I'm challenging because I think we need specifics. This is about making sure we have legislation that's on the floor of the House. If people aren't willing to support that legislation, tell us specifically what you would do to address that. What bill would you put your name on to make sure we can move forward? This isn't a time for slogans. It's time for solutions. And I think it's important that we have specifics. Mr. Sellers, you have 30 seconds yep. to respond. Specifics. I think it's very important that we improve the number of uh, guest workers. It's, you know, we don't have the correct number there. And those, for me, are minor things. Uh, a thing that is more important, more specific, is how do you deal with the people here undocumented? I've been saying that we should have something like a, a yellow card. You know what a green card is? Well, there's a yellow card. And that's people that are here undocumented should get that. And that does not put them in the carpool lane ahead of all the people who have a, a green card, but a way for them to be here legally. Another question regarding immigration, and again, specifics here from both of you. Uh, a little more than two years ago, President Obama, through executive order, established the DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which temporarily suspends deportation of dreamers, those young people brought to the U.S. not knowing that they were here undocumented. It also gives them a chance to work. So I want to know, where do you stand on DACA? And would you support expanding it to include others who are undocumented, not just the dreamers? So DACA, if you guys are not uh, aware of what that means, it's an executive action. It's not a law uh, that the president did to uh, not deport a bunch of kids for two years. It's a deferred action. I do not approve it because it undermines process in getting immigration reform moved forward. He should be engaging with the Senate in getting legislation to do it. That's not the way to do it. Okay, well, at least for two years we'll do that. Well, you can argue that, that point. But I think he needs to focus on getting this reform. The other part of the question is, do I approve of, in general, of uh, an immigration system that allows small kids to, to be here? And I have been supporting that you know, for a while. I had a, was a big um, endorser and supporter and made it happen, a bill that we had this year on what's called the Real Hope Act, which is a form of uh, uh, Guest worker, uh, not sorry, uh, Green Act, uh, Washington State Green Act. So I uh, think that um, these kids that are exceeding in the schools that we have, that we're funding for them, that they are going to universities, they should stay here because we have already invested in them. They are excellent role models. They help the community in many ways, other than by their work that they will do. So I I applaud what they have accomplished. All right, Susan um, I'd like to start with a story about a student who lives in our district in Mount Vernon, Juan. He is a high school student. He is an honor student. He's in Running Start. He is a volunteer with the Boys and Girls Club. He is, works with his church. He's very active in community service. And yet he was about to be deported. He missed the Deferred Action Program by less than a month. He has grown up in this country. That's been his life. This is home for him. Um, I sent a letter along with our senators to, um, to hope that Juan would be allowed to stay, and he was. But it highlights how important it is that we support students like Juan. These are the types of students we should be supporting, not deporting. And the only way we're going to give them the long-term view of what can be, what's possible and so that they can actually achieve their goals and dreams is to make sure we pass comprehensive immigration reform. Um, it is true that deferred action is only good um, as long as this president is the president. 
And that's why it's incumbent on Congress to put together legislation, why I support comprehensive immigration reform that includes the DREAM Act. And it's so, so important that we allow legislation, bipartisan legislation like that to come forward so we give great opportunities to students in our region like Juan. Thank you very much. We're gonna change gears now and talk about the minimum wage. Seattle is raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour. President Obama has proposed raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10 .10 an hour over two years. Do you support that effort and why? And you have 90 seconds. We'll start with Susan Del Bene. I support raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10. .10. I'm a co-sponsor of legislation to do that. As you know, the current federal minimum wage is $7.25, and by raising it to $10.10, we'll lift ne nearly a million people out of, out of poverty. Women are disproportionately impacted, more women in minimum wage jobs, and so it has a big impact on women across our country, women and their families. But um, this is a piece of legislation that is very, very important and will have a big impact across our country. We have the highest minimum wage in Washington State, so it has a smaller impact here, about a quarter over the two years, but incredibly important difference across our country. It has strong support. I hope we're able to continue to push and move that legislation forward so that people who are working full-time in our country are in a position where they can support themselves and their families. Thank you. I do not support uh, raising the federal minimum wage to ten ten or fifteen dollars, and the reason for that is uh, this state already has the highest minimum wage, and it will have a pretty significant impact in other states quite dramatically, a lot more than here, and in this state it will really hurt more than help a lot of uh, young people and a lot of minority people that will end up losing their jobs. I see minimum wage as a starting job, not a, a, a living job. It's the job that you get the first time you go going to work. It's how you start going up that economic ladder. If you move it up, it will be harder for anybody to get that very first job. But the reason why this topic becomes up a lot is because people are not going up the ladder. You know, they're getting jobs and not going up. And that is the real problem here. It's not take that first step higher and higher and higher. It's that people are not being able to go up. And the reason why they're not going up has to do with a lot of the decisions that this president has been taking. There are all kinds of programs that affect, give this what they call disincentive to work. You know, it makes it harder for people to go up that ladder because as they go up, they start losing benefits, they start losing other things, and it's harder for them to succeed down there at those lower levels. So I don't think that the answer is to put that thing even worse. Thank you. All right. President Obama asked for and received congressional authorization to train moderate Syrian rebels. Is this the right strategy, or should there be American boots on the ground? What more is uh, your opinion in uh, what needs to be done to fight ISIS? Uh, you have 90 seconds, and Pedro Solis. Uh, so does the president have the right strategy to win this war? Doesn't seem that way. Uh, I, I'm concerned that he says it's important for us to win this war. And then he says, but we'll only win it if we cannot put any troops there. If this war is important, he, not, he needs to make that argument to the people and say, we must do this. It is not something that is just going to affect their life, but it affects our security. He needs to make that strong and say, and we will do whatever is needed to win that war. He's not saying that. He's saying, you know, I, I am kind of going to do it only so far. And there's no support. Nobody trusts that he is willing to do what is needed to win this war. What caused this war was creating this vacuum. You know, when he pulled all the troops, you know, from there because, you know, he could not negotiate, uh, even though he had a lot of leverage on getting our troops there, now we're in this uh, situation. I'm, I'm worried that the same thing will happen with Afghanistan. But I think he needs to decide whether he wants to win the war or not. And if he wants to win the war, he should come say that to the American public, get an authorization from Congress, and fight for it. I believe that ISIL represents a growing threat to American interests and allies in the Middle East. And it's very, very important that we have an international cooperation um, and an international effort to address this issue. 
I voted for legislation to train and equip moderate Syrian rebels. That piece of legislation does not support um, American boots on the ground. It is also a piece of legislation that's only good till December 11th. And so it's incredibly important that we have a full debate, a full debate in Congress on ISIL and on what the, our response is going to be. We should not be relying on authorization for use of military force from 2001. I actually voted to repeal the 2001 authorization because I think this Congress needs to make a decision on what the US is doing now. I think it's incredibly important. We need to be having that full debate and this Congress needs to raise its voice and do its job and make sure it, um, it weighs in on what is appropriate use of military action. And so I'm hopeful that we will do that and get, when we get back. Um, I'm disappointed we haven't had that conversation yet. All right, a little bit of a change of pace. We have some, some short questions and we'd like you to just take 30 seconds to respond to a series of short questions. The first one is um, about the Export-Import Bank. We're a heavily trade-dependent state here. Many exporters say the Export-Import Bank offers critical support. Other people say it's corporate welfare. Where do you stand? Susan Del Ben, you have 30 seconds. Um, I strongly support reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. I'm on legislation to do that and have been working with others to try to get support there. We only reauthorized it till June. It's disappointing. We need to provide that long-term visibility, and I would support a, um, a long-term reauthorization of Export-Import Bank. Pedro Salas. I will support the long-term authorization. I, I don't think it's costing the taxpayers money. It's not like we're losing money there, and therefore it's costing the taxpayers. Um, if there's any concerns about the risk associated with that, we should look at that and modify it if necessary. But I think we should continue with that bank. Here's an energy question. Where do you stand on the proposed Keystone Pipeline, which would run from Canada into the U.S.? And 30 seconds to answer for the Senate. I support it. It's uh, good for our economy. It's good for the environment. It's a safer way of moving oil. And there's all these excuses why it's not being approved. And I will be interested in seeing why our delegation is not fighting hard to make that approve. It affects the whole country positively. I think we're waiting on the president to make a decision. This is the president's decision. I have voted against efforts to um, circumvent the process that we go through on decisions like these. And um, the secretary of state has weighed in. There's been um, information. So we're waiting for the president to give us his decision. Another 30 second question, what's your position on coal being shipped through the Northwest by train and then on to Asia? Susan Del Bene, 30 seconds. Um, when I was elected, I asked for a comprehensive environmental impact study on, on the entire project that's being proposed up in Cherry Point in, in the first congressional district, a coal export facility, um, so that we have all the information available as people look at that. There are three issues, really. There's the issue of coal and the facility and of rail, and we need to make sure we look at this comprehensively, and that's the effort that um, is undergoing right now. Uh, short answer, I support it. Three reasons. I think it's good for the environment. Uh, this coal is shipping to China, and the other option is a coal that is worse. Uh, number two, it's good for a relation with China to have trade and have you know, more security with them. And number three, we'd rather have the jobs here instead of Canada, and that's the other option. If we don't build it on this side, it will just be sent from Canada. I'd rather have the jobs here. Okay. Question about guns. Initiative 594 would expand background checks on handgun purchases in Washington state. How will you vote on that initiative and explain why? 30 seconds to answer. I thought the uh, candidates were not supposed to say how they vote on things. Uh, anyway, I'm running out of time. I will vote against it. Uh, I believe that uh, it's addressing a, a valid question. Hey, is there a loophole here in the process? But what that regulation does does not address that loophole. It's just uh, preventing people from trade guns with their friends. I support 594. I am a co-sponsor of similar federal legislation that we, has been introduced in Congress. I think that we can protect Second Amendment rights and also make progress in making sure that criminals, for example, don't have access to, what, to firearms. And this is important legislation, important that and Washington State will We'll have a key voice on this um, here in the next few weeks. 
Thank you. We're going to go back to the longer questions now. Recreational marijuana is now legal in Washington, but because it remains illegal federally, local marijuana stores have had trouble finding banks that will handle their money. Should the federal government do anything to help these legal businesses? Susan Delbani, you have 90 seconds for that. Um, yes. I think that I supported um, Initiative 502, and I believe that Washington State now is in a position to implement laws that are very important, but for, in order for that to move forward, we need to make sure that we have a banking system that can support the legal businesses that are running in our state. Um, I'm on the Judiciary Committee. We've been working to make sure that to um, address issues of conflict between federal and state law, but there is legislation in the House that would help on this issue so that banks are able to do banking for legal marijuana businesses. And I'm a co-sponsor of that legislation, something that Congressman Denny Heck in the 10th Congressional District in Washington State has been leading the effort on. And we also know that many, many more states have initiatives on their ballots um, this election cycle. And so besides Colorado and Washington, we're going to see others um, most likely who are going to be part of this group. And so it's very important that we have legislation in particular to, um, to address the banking issue because it's a, it's a law enforcement issue if it ends up only being a cash only business. Peter Silis. Uh, I voted against that bill on her. I don't uh, approve of the use of marijuana. But in, this, in that particular case, the argument was uh, you have a black market. It's better to allow it than you kill the black market. And my concern is there's way too many risks associated with it. I'd rather have this experiment be done someplace else and not be uh, the, the experiment on how to manage a marijuana. What you're mentioning is one example of that, one of many. You know, there's a lot of uh, still black market because there's a lot of taxes. So now there's a, an interest in selling uh, that marijuana outside of the taxed part of it. On the banking side, I'm on the board of a bank. And a lot of the things that banks are forced to do is to monitor for money laundering. Uh, all kinds of regulations that banks have to apply or enforce to make sure there's no money laundering. And in the case of marijuana, then now you have a business that's part of the business doing that, and we have all kinds of additional uh, things that we have to deal with. I believe the banks should serve it because otherwise that money is moving a lot of cash in little boxes and that's just a, a little tool for more money laundering being used that way. All right, question about the Affordable Care Act. After a, a very troubled rollout, we've had about a year of Obamacare. Kaiser Health tracking poll shows that 47% uh, of Americans view the law unfavorably. Uh, Mr. Bene, is it working? And uh, Mr. Celis, do you plan to join the Republicans that have been in Congress who have actively been working to repeal it? Let's start with you, Mr. Celis. You have 90 seconds. So I agree with the goal and not the solution of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I mean, the goal is we want people that are uninsured to be insured. We want to control the cost of health care. And if you like your doctor, you should keep it. If you like your insurance, you should keep it. And that's not what has been accomplished with the Affordable Care Act. I will support regulations to modify it. I think it, it's fatally flawed. I'll give you one story that I like telling. A friend of mine manages a little company. He's a Latino. He has a bunch of employees. One of them gets about 50000 a year. Last November, he got a raise, $8,000 more. Two months later, in January, he comes and says, can you lower my salary back? Why? Because by having raised my salary, once I take into account the other taxes, I now lost the subsidies that Obamacare will give to me and to my family. I'm better off working less. And that's just one example of the many uh, bad things in that system. I think it's uh, fatally flawed, and we should replace it. You know, if you're just arguing that it's wrong, you should have an argument on how you should do it instead. Can you go back? Um, I, like many of you, was very disappointed in the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. And I also believe that it's very important that we have affordable, quality health care available to everyone in this country. And there is a great example, a teacher in my district um, who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer over seven years ago. She was about to hit her lifetime cap on insurance coverage. 
And because of the Affordable Care Act and no, not being denied coverage or having lifetime caps, um, she was able to continue to get the health care that she needed um, without bankrupting her family and has made an incredible difference in her life. Um, it's cr there are many things that have been important to constituents throughout our region. It's been ending lifetime caps, um, allowing people to have access to health care who had pre-existing conditions, parents keeping their kids on their plans um, till they're 26, many things that have made a difference throughout for families. And we've seen our uninsured population decline by 6% in Washington state. That said, I think we got to see what's working and what's not working and make responsible reforms. I have two pieces of legislation, one to help support small businesses who are trying to offer health care for their employees, so important to expand tax credits for them, and also some technical changes to help families. Um, it's important we have people work together, once again, to make sure everyone has access to affordable quality health care in our country. Thank you. This year, the Supreme Court allowed Hobby Lobby uh, to not cover contraceptive coverage to women through Obamacare on religious grounds. What do you think about that ruling and why? Uh, Ms. Delbeni, you have 90 seconds to respond. I was extremely disappointed in the Hobby Lobby ruling. I think that women should make their own health care decisions with their doctors, and those decisions should not be made by politicians and should not be made by their employers. It's so important that people have access to the health care they need and very disappointing that this decision came down. I have been working with others in Congress to look at potential legislative options to try to address um, some of the issues that have been brought up by the Supreme Court case. But it's very, very important that we continue to make sure that women are able to make their own health care decisions and that we support that. Um, so I'm very disappointed in that decision. Mr. Salis? I thought it was a good decision. The, uh, it was a very narrow decision. But what the Supreme Court did is said, hey, you know, we have a law that says companies cannot be obligated to do certain things. In this case, were abortion pills type of thing. You know, and you, the president, wrote this thing on top of Obamacare that is contrary to it. I disagree with her that says, uh, that's the reason now why a woman has to talk to their employer whether they want to take that pill or not. I mean, She's basically saying up till December, they had to do that, and then now that this started, for six months they didn't, and now they have to go back to that. This is just who has to pay for that bill, uh, that pill, sorry. And if a company is not, does not feel that they must be forced to pay for it because of moral rules, the government should not be pushing in. It's there, the government can pay for it. There are other ways of dealing with it, but you should not be taking that right from companies uh, to make those choices. Do you have a challenge? Yeah, 30 seconds. Go ahead. I don't believe that corporations are people, and I think it's incredibly important that women are, have all their health care options available to them and that they can make their own decisions. Um, where does it end? Where, what's the next thing that a company decides someone can't do? Can they not have blood transfusions or vaccines? Um, how, do you, how do you view this? Why is it a unique issue for, for women, and why should we be um, letting corporations make those decisions on what type of health care options women have? Um, it's not the employer that is deciding whether a corporation, uh, an individual, should take you know, one of those pills or not. The employer is not known. The employer cannot be informed of anything. If you know anything about the privacy issues, you, know, you go to a doctor, you do whatever, your employer doesn't get to know anything about you. The only thing is a company is it forced to not have to pay something that is against their values. And you're making an argument that corporations don't have, uh, are not people, and therefore they don't have rights. I disagree with that. Okay. Let's move on here. Uh, a question about independence. Give us at least one issue that you disagree with your own party, uh, so much so that you would buck your party leadership and vote for the position of independence or the folks on the other side of the aisle. And please be specific. Brother Rosalie, let's start with you. Me first? Well, I, I don't think uh, the government shutdown was a good idea. Uh, I, I agree with the goals, not the solution. Not, you know, sometimes you lose a battle to win a war. I don't think this one worked in that way. Um, but it's uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. You know, 
I don't think it should have been done that way, uh, but you know, I wasn't there in the middle of it. Uh, but that's an example of where I think, you know, I don't think that was the proper way uh, to handle how do we force uh, Congress to balance its budget. Uh, that's why I support a balanced budget amendment. We need forcing functions. If you don't have forcing functions, things don't happen. Many of you have managed all kinds of organizations. You know that you need forcing functions to make things happen. Mm -hmm. And we need something like that. The state has it, you and your family have it, but the federal government doesn't. And that was not the good way to do a forcing function. Susan, go back. Um, a very specific issue, I disagree with the issue of the administration's view on domestic surveillance. I disagree with the actions the NSA has taken, and I was a leader in making sure that we put together legislation to rein in the NSA and put back in place the balance between our civil liberties and national security. Um, we had votes even in last year, um, and was, I was a, a rare vote there on, on legislation, and we've moved forward and built a stronger coalition, a bipartisan coalition. Um, on legislation that would increase transparency on what's being asked, for example, of technology companies in terms of the information they should reveal about the national security letters that they're getting, um, to address bulk collection of data, and to have an advocate in these private um, private courts that argues on behalf of the public, so there's an adversarial system there that has not been taking place. Um, that bill was watered down when it came to the floor of the House of Representatives, and I voted against it. It's in the Senate now, and I'm hoping that they'll add back provisions to strengthen that. But it's a very, very critically important issue that I've been working hard on and been a leader on. And it's been a coalition of people on both sides of the aisle to help make sure that we get this legislation moving forward. Did you have a challenge? Yep. We have a challenge. Yeah, 30 seconds. Um, so she's talking about the bill that she voted against. And it was a bill that controls the NSA access to your information. And I'm sure it's nowhere close to what I would like that bill to do. But it shows that inability to negotiate and accomplish the parts that you, that you need to do. Our bill actually came out of the Judiciary Committee with bipartisan support, strong bipartisan support. It was on the floor that amendments were made to weaken that bill. Um, and in a bipartisan fashion, there are many of us who voted against it because we think it could be stronger. Part of being a strong legislator is making sure that you make sure the right legislation moves forward. And that's an important part of the process. Thank you. Both of your campaigns talk about being more efficient as a government and cutting wasteful spending. So give us three good ideas for cutting wasteful spending. Starting with you, Ms. Del Bennett, you have 90 seconds. Um, you know, it's incredibly important in Congress that we budget and we look at things that are giving a, us a great return on our investment and make sure we invest in those and look at things that aren't giving us a great return and end those programs. Um, very specifically, um, in the Farm Bill, we ended direct payments, money that was sometimes going to people who weren't even growing crops. By ending direct payments, we actually are reducing the deficit by billions of dollars over the next 10 years. Um, if we would pass comprehensive immigration reform, we would reduce the deficit as well. The CBO says um, $200 billion over the next uh, decade. Very, very important. Um, we also need to look at tax breaks that we give and realize that we are providing tax subsidies in places where we're not getting a great return. One example would be tax breaks for big oil companies. We would save um, and reduce the deficit by $4 billion a year just by ending those. And th that's dollars that, again, um, can be used to address the deficit and the debt or can be used to make sure we invest in things that give us a great return, um, help grow our economy. So those are a few specific examples. Thank you. Mr. Sellis. Uh, so we need a forcing function because that's what, what makes uh, things uh, move. Uh, a forcing function, like a balanced budget amendment, is a way of doing it. But your question is more, okay, well, since you don't have it, what would you do now in the meantime? Uh, you know, there's plenty of agencies that it's hard for me to find one that I'm proud on how efficient and how effective they are. Uh, you know, EPA, IRS, you know, those are easy ones to, to go and, and reduce the spending. But I'll focus a little bit more on the Farm Bill because she has been touting as one of the best Farm Bills for this state. And as I go up and down the district, that's not what I hear. They all tell me about the huge expenditure. And I'm talking about a lot of money there that is not really affecting this state. 
And all that money is helping corporations that should not be helped with your taxpayers' money. Um, so, you know, that will be a good one to, to focus on. I mean, if she thinks that this is the best farm bill for the state, that will be one in which we could have cut quite a bit of the spending um, that is not necessary for the state. All right. What taxes would you like to see raised? And what taxes would you like to see cut? We have 90 seconds, but there's somebody to start with you first. I would like to get um, pretty much all forms of uh, deductions uh, removed. Now, there's all kinds of companies that, if they specialize in this, if they specialize in that, and specialize in that, they get uh, subsidies. Uh, and so I'm calling that raising taxes, you know, because now you're going to tax them for something that today uh, they, they wouldn't have to, to tax. I will focus a lot on, on those are the, the taxes that I will be raising. And the taxes that I will be lowering will be the ones that affect, we have this community of people that have a need and we're not helping them by giving them um, subsidies and things like that that they lose as they go up. I will change that into giving them uh, a tax break that they keep no matter how far they, their economic ladder goes. So it's a little bit spending of money there to get them not be trapped into this disincentive to work mechanisms that many of the programs have been doing. I think I lost you there in the question. I'll try again later. <laughs> okay. You have 30 more seconds. You want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Oh, sure. Okay. I thought I was done. Uh, let me elaborate on that. Uh, for example, I was talking about this uh, Obamacare, you know, this employee, he loses his money and whatever. I, I think that's one example of many others in which um, they should be getting some help as they're going up, that they don't lose as they go up that economic ladder. Okay. I think we need comprehensive tax reform. Our tax code looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. It's got exemptions and subsidies. And if you have enough accountants and attorneys, you can navigate through that. But it's very complex and hard for families and small businesses. And so we need to, to make changes. And we need to make those changes based on what's really working to help our economy. We need to make sure that we are looking at things that might have been put in place in a time that worked at that point in time, but end them. Seems like nothing ends. So things like tax breaks for big oil companies, they're highly profitable. They don't need those anymore. Those are things that we should be getting rid of. We also should look at tax policy that encourages jobs to be shipped overseas and make sure that we don't have tax incentives for that. Um, but also another important piece of tax policy is making our, sure that our tax policy is working. Um, and in Washington State, we have one area It's very important that we make a change um, because our local businesses are struggling because they are losing business to out-of-state online retailers who don't have to collect sales tax. It's a tax that's owed, but they don't have to collect. And so I'm a co-sponsor of bipartisan legislation called the Marketplace Fairness Act that would help our local businesses places like the running store where um, they're losing business to online folks um, to make sure that everyone's collecting those sales taxes. So again, we have an equal playing field that helps our local communities and our local businesses. Thank you. Can we talk about climate change? How high up in your list of priorities is climate change? And what's your one best idea for fighting climate change? Uh, Susan Delbeni, you've got 90 seconds. So climate change is a very real threat. It, we have information that proves that climate change is a very real threat right now to our economy, to the future of our children, to our way of life, and it's very, very important that we address this. Um, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we are supporting development of clean, renewable energy it's very important, it's a huge opportunity right here in Washington State where we've been very innovative and can learn um, and provide that, provide that learning to others, not only in the, in the United States but around the world. Part of that is looking at things like the grid, at um, storage so we can store energy, to look at new ways to use wind and solar, to um, continue to invest and make sure that we have a strong, clean, renewable energy infrastructure. That's very, very important because without all of that work going on, we're not going to have ongoing alternatives. We also need to invest in energy efficiency, make sure that um, every, every bit of energy that's being used is being used as wisely as possible. Again, Washington State is a leader here, but we can continue to be an economic leader um, ourselves by making sure we support strong innovation. 
Thank you. Pedro Celis. Uh, in this country, the amount of CO2 that is uh, produced has been going down, you know, now down to the level it was 13 years ago. And that's not because the federal government has been doing anything about it or because it's been taxing, you know, the poor and the middle class uh, to have them consume less energy. It has been because of oil. You know, oil is becoming more important, cheaper, and therefore replacing uh, coal. And, uh, you know, you ask for specific ideas that I will do to help uh, the, the environment. You know, I will uh, focus on getting those pipelines approved. You know, I don't see why the president keeps delaying them. That's good for the economy, it's good for us to export some of that oil, but it's good for our environment uh, to have that, more of that. And I will also allow dams. You know, I think that they are a great way of getting energy and a lot of people oppose dams, and I'm sure there's better ways of doing them, uh, but that's one of the better ways of, particularly in this state, of getting energy. Farmers have been uh, critical of the EPA for proposed rules that would widen administration of the uh, Clean Water Act to include more agricultural land. I'd like to know where the both of you stand on this. Uh, Pedro Salis, let's start with you first, 90 seconds. So the, last September, uh, there was a, a bill in the House that was passed to try to control the EPA on exactly that. And that's something that was uh, crucial for the farm industry. It was passed in a bipartisan fashion. It was something that the state farm uh, organizations are asking for it. And it was something that Susan Del Bennett voted against. So it's not one, uh, it's not a bill that really helps the farm industry. It's not a bill that uh, is, you know, that shows bipartisanship. And that's an example of the overregulation that I'm seeing all around. EPA is usually one of the topics, it's not the only one, but EPA in particular to the use of water in private lands is a topic that I, every week somebody mentions to me. It is a very controversial EPA rule and I'm co-sponsor of legislation to help address that. Um, address it in a way that also makes sure we protect um, our water and support our farmers. The disappointing thing on the bill that came to the floor um, that was voted on is that it actually removed the rule and did not allow a solution going forward, so left this in limbo. I think it's very important that we put together responsible legislation. I think that we have a responsible bill out there that supports our farmers and supports clean water. And I'd love to see that legislation move forward because that will, again, provide a, a great solution to this issue. All right, it's time now for our closing statements. Uh, each candidate has 90 seconds. The order was determined in advance, and we begin with Pedro Celis. Okay, so I'm Pedro Celis, and I'm here to make a pitch on why you should vote for me. And I'll give you three arguments. Um, one has to do, I think this country is going in the wrong direction. The president said his name is not in the ballot, but his policies are in the ballot. And you really need a check and balance uh, to that president. You don't want somebody like Susan Del Bene that is approving pretty much everything this president is doing. 94% of her votes go with the party. Uh, so you really need somebody that does check and balances here. Uh, number two, you want to vote for somebody that has that ability to be a problem solver and a consensus builder, that work with people with diverse point of views, diverse opinions, and get things accomplished. You know, I did that, uh, it was mentioned before with the State Senate on the Real Hope Act. I did it last November in the uh, King County Council. Uh, the Republican mainstream partnership is endorsing me because I'm the kind of guy the Republicans, the kind of Republican they like that knows how to work up across party lines and how to get things accomplished. And number three, because I'm doing this to serve this country, I'm not running for Congress uh, to be somebody. I'm running for, some, for Congress to serve this country. I did not spend $5 million of my own money to try to get this seat. I have a name already, and I'm happy. Right. Susan Delbert. Um, I think it's so important that we have people who are willing to work together to get things done, and that's what I've been focused on since I've been in office. It's also important that we have people who represent our values, values like equality and personal choice. 
and opportunity for everyone in our country. And it's personally very important to me that everyone has access to opportunity, because I did. Um, my dad lost his job when I was young, and we moved all over the country as my parents looked for work. And there was a lot of financial instability, but I got to go to college and get a great education because of student loans and financial aid and work study programs. And that great education helped me to be, have a successful career and be in the position that I'm in today. I don't know if I were growing up today if I would have had that same access to opportunity, and that's something that we're all fighting for. We need people who are willing to stand up, and I think we have a clear choice in this election, a clear choice of someone who's willing to stand up and make sure we support families throughout our region by supporting comprehensive immigration reform, raising the federal minimum wage, college affordability, and equal pay for equal work. It's also important that we have folks who are willing to support um, a woman's right to make her own health care decisions with her doctor. Those aren't decisions that should be made by politicians. And again, we have a clear choice in this election. I'm going to continue to work hard to get policies um, passed that help our region, and I ask for your support again in this election. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. And that is all the time that we have for this debate. We'd like to thank the Seattle City Club, Microsoft, and Boeing for partnering with us on this debate. Thanks also to the audience, and thanks to the candidates who joined us today. Let's give them one more round of applause. And thank you at home for joining us as well. All right, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Next week on KCTS 9, a debate over gun control. Proponents of initiatives 591 and 594 argue whether Washington state should require background checks on all gun sales. Election 2014, the gun control debate, next Wednesday night at 7, here on KCTS 9.